Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is James Hansen. I have the pleasure of serving as group publisher of Federal and Technology Markets at GovExec, and I'm excited to welcome you to today's webcast, Cyber Hygiene, Reducing the Risk of Cyber Attacks with Data and Automation. As evidenced in recent news, today's organizations, both private and public sectors, face an ever increasingly barrage of cyber attacks that pose a threat to their data, operations, and customers. Even the most advanced cyber defenses are challenged by the complexity of new and innovative tools uh, employed by hackers. Uh, however, the standardization of attack reporting, information sharing processes, the focus on zero trust architecture, and investment in automation tools have been helping agencies construct appropriate cybersecurity strategies to protect them against future cyber attacks. And today, that's what we're here to discuss. So to uh, have that conversation, I am thrilled to be joined by retired Major General Earl Matthews, the Vice President of Strategy for Mandiant, Gerald Caron, the Acting Chief Information Officer with the Department of Health and Human Services Office of the Inspector General, and Victor Troyan, the Assistant Division Chief for Cybersecurity Operations at the U.S. Census Bureau. Just a little housekeeping before we get started, I want to thank our event partners and sponsors, FireEye Mandiant, for uh, hosting today's important conversation. We encourage you to share your own perspectives and questions via our interactive chat. Uh, we hope you'll contribute to the conversation. Uh, we'll follow up with any uh, answers to questions we don't get to about how to tackle uh, some of government's most complicated cybersecurity challenges. Now with that, let's get started. Uh, Earl, uh, tell us a little bit about your role at Mandiant and priorities when it comes to driving innovation and cybersecurity. Yeah, well, thanks everybody. Happy to be here with my distinguished colleagues in the government. Uh, what I would say is my primary role is to help map out uh, what will the future of cybersecurity look like. And for us, when we look at the SOC of the future, really a fusion center, the only way that we're going to be able to tackle this problem is to bring automation to help augment what our people do. And within that process, how do we start applying more machine learning and other artificial intelligence capabilities so that we can start driving the security organization to be data centric and data driven versus being a manual uh, operation with some automation today. But more importantly, how do we make our people more efficient and present the information to them so that they can make a, uh, a more uh, reasoned decision about what's happening? Excellent. Uh, Gerald, I'm going to pick on you next. You want to tell us a little about your role at uh, HHS OIG? Yeah, so I, I'm no longer acting. I, I, I got the permanent position as of last, this past month. So, oh, um, congratulations. Am, no problem. You wouldn't have known. Uh, but I am the CIO for HHS OIG. So one of the things that I am introducing is um, my architecture on zero trust. Um, Earl said it very well, I think, is you know, we can no longer rely on signature based um, tools. We, we have to rely on AI, ML, I think going in the future because you know, the, the, the new threat is very advanced, uh, very well funded, you know, nation states, things like that, that you know, we don't have signatures for. And we know how long, sometimes we're lucky to find things um, when they're happening. And sometimes I think Earl can correct me where I'm wrong, probably, but it can take up to 60 days, I think on average to find that you have an intrusion or some sort of malicious activity happening. So for zero trust, it's very dynamic. It's very automated um, in the concepts that, I, that I've developed in my architecture, as well as it's gonna rely a lot on machine learning and AI, because why is that is because what's normal look like? You know, a lot of a lot of agencies, I, sometimes it's, it's a struggle to figure out what normal looks like. And if you have trouble what, knowing what normal looks like and where your data resides and where it's flowing, 
and what the categorization of that data is, it's going to be hard to pull the triggers to take immediate actions on things if you don't know what normal looks like. Um, and, and some of those things that I mentioned. It's gonna take a lot of factors coming in and that's gonna be unstructured data to do it in a dynamic fashion. Um, you're gonna have to make that unstructured data make sense so that you can have those triggers based off what normal looks like. So I think machine learning and AI are really gonna play a big part as Earl said uh, going forward. But the great thing about zero trust, if done correctly, um, there's still a lot of people that define it differently. Um, if done correctly, you're protecting a against both the outsider, which a lot of people are really focused on, but also the insider, which we know has been, you know, probably the most damaging with the Snowdens and the Hansons of the past. Um, but definitely it, it protects against both equally. So that's what I have going on. And I also co-chair, I'm a co-chair for the CIO's Innovation Council Working Group on Zero Trust, as well as uh, a nonprofit that I do. I do a co-chair for a Zero Trust Working Group there as well. That's awesome. And we're definitely going to dive into uh, a lot of that uh, throughout the conversation, I hope. Uh, Victor, do you mind giving us a little uh, intro in terms of uh, your role at the Census Bureau and how you guys are looking at innovation in cybersecurity? So I'm uh, over the cybersecurity operations branch, which is composed of two components, uh, the security operations center, so our SOC 24 by seven monitoring, and then our cyber threat branch, which is uh, composed of our pen testers, our forensics and hunt team, as well as our cyber threat intel team. Uh, at Census, we're in a uh, cyber threat driven model. So we try to identify who is most likely to be targeting our uh, data and our resources and try to adapt our defenses to be able to react to that and uh, be more aware of what's happening with that. So that drives our entire program. So we work with our information security officers, our security engineers. Uh, we provide them with the data to understand what's happening. We talk to our program areas, so the different divisions within census who provide the different surveys and provide the different data so they know the threats that are going against them. And then we also um, provide that information within our team so that that drives our penetration testing so we can continuously look for vulnerabilities that fit the TTPs of our adversaries and then also fit um, uh, uh, what the adversaries are trying to, uh, what data they're trying to get. And then that also drives our hunt operations, which um, they use that information to build their hypotheses on what they're looking for and what TTPs those actors are using. Um, and then as far as innovation goes, we're working with our security engineers and uh, some of our other uh, divisions within our office of chief information officer. So our telecommunications office, our services, our server divisions, so that we can look into how do we go to zero trust? How do we improve the security across the environment so we can deal with the threats that we're actually looking at now uh, that have gotten as um, uh, they've said so far, uh, more advanced and more complex and harder to spot. That's fantastic. Uh, and I think that provides a really great baseline uh, for, for the conversation. Uh, let's start with the threat landscape. Uh, cyber threats are constantly evolving as we've certainly seen over the past six months. There's new attackers, um, there's new vulnerabilities, security risks that are arising every day. Um, and Earl, I'm going to start with you. Uh, what is changing? Um, it seems like there's so much happening. There's so many different attacks across different sectors, whether it be infrastructure or networks. Um, you know, what's changing and what should government really be concerned about right now? Yeah, so that is a broad <laughs> question. But uh, what, I, what I think I want to do is tackle it this way is that, um, you know, we've seen supply chain attacks, right, with solar winds. We've seen now continued ransomware attacks with Colonial and uh, JBS. And so from a government standpoint, whole of government standpoint, our critical infrastructure is under uh, significant attack, more than we've ever seen it before. And uh, last month, we released our annual M-Trends report, all right, the Mandiant Trends report, which makes it clear that threat actors have re rapidly increased in not only in their sophistication over the last year, but they're also using techniques that make them harder to spot and that threaten even the savviest targets. And we were one of those targets. So for example, 
Nation state actors are engaging in new reconnaissance techniques that have increased their chances of compromising a high value target. Criminal groups are targeting businesses, right? They have, and they've moved their infrastructure to the cloud. So that way they can hide amongst uh, legitimate services. And the attackers have developed new ways to scour the internet for systems vulnerable to ransomware. Uh, in addition to this, the attacks are uh, becoming more sophisticated. The threat actors are showing clear preferences now for certain techniques with notable shifts towards credential harvesting and ransomware, as well as increasing their focus on the Internet of Things devices. So one of the things that we said in our um, M-Trends report is that these threat groups and malware families continue, much like past years, we see this mix of net new actors active among with the traditional intrusion groups. And so last year we had identified over 652, what we call clusters of threat activity that raised the total number to over 2000. So while we think it's important to note that the threat landscape is more diverse than any previous time based solely on the pure net new threat groups, we still also see these similar trends for malware families. More importantly, we continue to see groups blur their lines between public and private tools. And they're also varying their motivations and actions, in some cases attempting to look different, like a different threat activity. So uh, the three common most cyber attack vectors this last year, and it'd be great to see if my colleagues are seeing this too, is, is um, of course the exploits. So those are about 29%. Phishing emails continue to be about 23%. And then stolen credentials, right, or even using brute force is about 19%. So in summary, what I would say is that we have more groups using a mix of public and private. And we even for the first time saw the Chinese using ransomware following the solar winds attack. Um, and of course, you know, it's not uncommon for North Korea, but it certainly was for the Chinese government to follow that with ransomware attacks that we normally associate with cyber criminals. So that's how, how I would summarize that. So if you throw it over, um, Gerald, is, are you guys seeing similar um, attack vectors? Uh, if, from, from what I pay attention to, yeah. I mean, it, a lot of it comes down to bad admin hygiene sometimes, uh, especially if you're a big agency and you have a very distributed model. Um, you know, it's just bad admin hygiene. Uh, we, we know, you know, simple passwords. Um, that are easily brute forced, as Earl mentioned, you know, um, we, we had that with, with another product around the same time as SolarWinds that was found, but I think it got kind of buried because SolarWinds was so um, prevalent. But I, I think one of the things, and, and this is Jerry going on of, on his opinion, is that as, an, as a government or as, as we're kind of been doing over the years in our security, we've been focusing on compliance, you know, there's the FISMA 853 controls, you know, and it will say, uh, you must provide authentication for your system. Okay, uh, I can use username and password to provide authentication. Check, I'm compliant. Do we know, we know that's not effective though. So I think we got to shift more to an effectiveness. And I think the, the, the new executive order helps push it that way. I think zero, uh, especially with doing zero trust, but we got to know how to measure effectiveness because I can be compliant, but that doesn't mean I'm being effective. So I think we have to push. Um, and I, you know, I get on my soapbox all the time with whomever I can listen and say, you know, we got to push towards effectiveness because I've seen the game played where, you know, Hey, as long as I can check that box, I'm good. You know, I got the OIGs or the auditors or whomever off my back. Um, and I've satisfied it. Um, I'm compliant. And, but I think we need more blue teaming. I think we need more red teaming. And I think blue teaming helps find weaknesses. Red teaming will break in and tell you how they broke in. But blue teaming will help continually find your weaknesses and your effectiveness. So how can we better keep doing that? I think that would be very helpful um, going forward. Victor, so building off that and, um, you know, Gerald mentioned something that kind of brings us all the way back to today's conversation around cyber hygiene. How do you define cyber hygiene? How do you know whether your cyber hygiene is simply checking the compliance box or actually driving towards effective cybersecurity practices? So I guess I would define cyber hygiene as 
your overall cybersecurity program and the way it's implemented. So we know with um, everyone in our groups, we rely on IT. Everything is critical related to IT, but IT is constantly um, at risk and has vulnerabilities. Even if you patch tomorrow, a zero day could come out of those type items. So the basic cyber hygiene is making sure that you're um, uh, patched against those vulnerabilities, your systems are locked down, but you have to go beyond that. So um, when you're doing, you know, Gerald kind of mentioned it, when you talk about compliance, it's, it's a checkbox sometimes where people just, they check that we've implemented this piece, but you can use penetration testing teams to actually go in and test whether the controls are effective to actually accomplish the goals of the specific controls, or, you know, does the setting actually do what it's supposed to do? Um, you can have, like for us, it's we have our cyber threat intel team that's constantly looking to find out what new exploits are out there, what zero days are being run, you know, are we vulnerable to that? So that our team can quickly go and identify, you know, is that exploit being used against us? Are our systems vulnerable to it? Do we see any traffic that kind of aligns to that? So it's a quick way to be proactive and, and once you identify, move in that direction to make sure you're more secure. But with IT systems, it's constantly gonna change a system. You can put in a new patch and you open two other holes. So you have to constantly be aware of that. And then you got to figure out how can we also improve and automate. Um, Earl talked a little bit about automating your, your responses so that your incident response is quicker, your, your uh, identification and uh, of attacks is quicker so that you can see when the activity goes in that direction. So it's, it's getting to the point where you're, you're adapting to the attacks quickly through automation to quickly identify them and be able to react. Um, I think FireEye put it out a long time ago in one of their uh, fire uh, mirror cons where they talked about none of the attackers look at a system to say if it's compliant. That's nothing they look at. No one goes, oh, this system's compliant. I'm not going to attack it. They, they go in and do it, and it comes down to how resilient are you? How quickly can you respond and recover from an attack? You know, you still have to, you still do the compliance. It's a requirement. There are aspects of it that are, that are important. However, you, you need to be able to do it in a way that you can actually validate that it's working. And like Gerald said, blue teaming is good. Red teaming is good. Purple teaming is really good. Get your um, penetration testers together with your SOC. So when they're running the exploits, at, um, acting like the adversary, you can actually see if your, um, your rules are firing the way they should. Is your SOC responding to what they should? Do the, the, the uh, administrators of the system see what's happening? So that you can quickly identify that and as you you can do it sometimes you start off where they're working together to train them and, and do that activity and then other times you do it sort of kind of like the red team where you don't let them know the activity is going but someone knows and they're watching to see the activity that happens does someone react to it and that way you have a more proactive um, more functional uh, security related to it yes I'd, I'd like to pile onto that to that to that part <laughs> Right, so I think you have it exactly right. You know, when we look at, hey, how do you know if I have good hygiene or not? It's really predicated on those assessments that you described, right? Whether they're the red teams, pen tests, um, you know, hunt teams, or even you know, internal and external audits. And you know, what we have to get to then is how do we take the output of that and then put it into an automated capability that continues that continues and continuously assesses my environment because really at the end of the day, we want the red teams and those hunt teams to bring their A game to the A problem. And what I see what's happening is they're bringing their A game to the B problem and they happen to find all that stuff. And so I kind of like to use the word, uh, Vic, you know, environmental drift to describe all the changes that are happening every single day in the environment. And like you said, when did we know that, hey, we've we applied a patch, but it created two more problems for me, right? Brings me back to my COBOL days, putting a period in, and I went in and fixed all the problems only to find out that, that as soon as I fixed that period problem, all the other problems went away, right? But this is somewhat in, in, in reverse. So I think, you know, you guys have it, you know, exactly right, is how do we get ourselves to be a more mature organization and reduce our cyber hygiene problem, which I have always professed is about 85% of what we deal with every day, and if we can keep get that down, then let's put the 15% and put our people to the big problems that we're having.
And Earl, let me uh, ask a quick follow on. Uh, Victor mentioned cyber threat intelligence. How does how do you take that cyber threat intelligence and apply that to automation or the AI capability algorithms that are baked in that it's so it's constantly learning? I mean, if threat actors are constantly changing the way that they are approaching um, a vulnerability, how do you ensure that that threat intelligence gets baked into the process? Yeah, I, you know, just, you know, I'm a longtime public servant, like the, the gentleman on the call with me today. And what we learn is that it doesn't really matter if you're defending a nation, a building, or a network. You really need to have the best threat intelligence you can get. Because what we're trying to do then is understand what is the risk. And that risk is determined by the probability of that threat and the likelihood of that threat that is being targeted against me. So SolarWinds is a good example of that. Yeah, there are 300 something thousand customers, 18,000 customers downloaded it, right? But at the end of the day, there are only 50 or 60 customers that were really targeted out of that number. So if you were one of those other 18,000 and you weren't in that target group, which was you know, uh, the government, uh, research agencies and so forth, you probably were okay. So you have to understand that. So when you have the threat intelligence in context, then what you need to be able to do is say, okay, I want to go test myself against APT41 because they target organizations like me. And I have it. So I have it in context. Now, how do I go test my controls for it? So the, the ability to be able to maneuver from the threat intelligence in context and test my environment to be able to see, am I susceptible to that or not? Or do I need to tune my controls? That's where the threat intelligence piece comes in. And one important piece that I would add on to this is that it's great if you can get that data, but if you're not using, you know, the, or emulating the enemy, you know, tactic techniques and procedures, meaning emulate, not simulate, because there's a difference and you're not using the actual real binaries to do that testing, you're really not gonna help yourself because as we add in more machine learning, as we've talked about, or other artificial intelligence capabilities, all those things would be learning the wrong behaviors if you use neutered malware or simulated malware in order to do your testing controls. So that's how I tie together the threat intelligence is really to operationalize it so I can test my environment. That's great. Um, I want to shift gears a little bit. Um, and uh, Gerald, I'll go to you, uh, just given your, you know, efforts in zero trust, because I think that that plays a direct impact with the workforce uh, now often accessing critical systems remotely. How has that impacted security? What new challenges have arisen uh, or accelerated the threat environment? First and foremost, uh, because of the, the remote telework that we've done this past year, um, we, we've, we've, we've accepted a different risk tolerance than we have before, most definitely. Um, one of the things is, is, you know, what we had maybe on a two-year roadmap for, for doing remote type work, we did within months. Um, so we had to accept a lot of risk, um, you know, and we tried to do so smartly as possible. And this is course for my last agency because I've just been here a little while um, but in my last position you know uh, was pr primarily responsible for a lot of the infrastructure and a lot of the implementation of some security so therefore you know um, we had to assess some risk so what controls do we put in place what mitigations do we put in place you know proxies things like that um, so looking forward um, you know tick 3.0 is awesome um, and I think it lends itself to zero trust being that non-prescriptive um, as it was before with the previous versions, given some flexibility, you know, I can get the same security telemetry possibly without having to boomerang back to my on-premises network and, and I can go send my user straight to the cloud rather than having that boomerang effect just to go out through a tick, uh, established tick. And, you know, I can do it as a service, I can do it in various different ways, but still get that same security telemetry I need um, and, and, you know, and, and make those decisions. Um, I think when, when we talk about zero trust, you know, a lot of people talk about it and, and I hate to say this, but a lot of people, identity, identity, identity. And it's like, no, it's a lot more than that. First of all, yeah, okay. If you're coming from the identity aspect, 
it is about is in let's say uh james you get compromised right your identity compromised you know brute force because you have you're using password one two three four or um you know and what is what is the cybersecurity guys gonna say i'm sure victor's folks are gonna say all right what did he have access to and is there exfil so what is it what is it what does it come to it's talking about the data that's what we're trying to protect that's our gold that's what we all live on nowadays with the it systems is it's providing us data all data is not created equal so do we properly categorize our data do we know where our data resides and do we know where our data is flowing because a lot of people talk about a user accessing data that's very static but data is always system to system triggered too, being shared so can I understand where that's flowing? Is it flowing where it normally is supposed to do? And I think that's where, again, AI and ML are going to come in and help you baseline that. Uh, because at the end of the day, I need to know, is my data protected? You know, I'm going to protect my crown jewels better than I'm going to protect my bologna sandwich. I'm going to move my, you know, protections closer around those crown jewels. Um, also, you know, authentication is done in a very linear fashion nowadays, you know, it's like going to the movie theater. They take my ticket in the lobby. They don't check it at the movie doors and the multiplex. I can walk into any movie. I need them at the ticket takers at the doors. And I need that usher coming in constantly and checking, am I in the right movie? Am I supposed to be there? Or am I in the wrong movie? And remove me if I'm not. Or make me upgrade my ticket otherwise. So I think that's some of the things that I'm looking at. We do this peanut butter spread approach, what I call it nowadays, where we try to protect everything equally. Um, but all things aren't created equal, right? We know uh, a big organization getting a hundred percent patch status is a pretty difficult task at times. Um, you know, there's agent problems or not, uh, but really are the main things that I need to focus on the protections, are they properly patched or uh, my protections? If my bologna sandwich gets compromised and somebody takes and eats it from me, all right, are my crown jewels still protected? I need to be able to answer that question. I can replace my bologna sandwich. There's plenty of bologna and bread in the world. Um, but as long as it doesn't escalate to get to my crown jewels, fine. Um, you know, and we got to get away from that uh, soft outer, the Tootsie Roll Pop, the, the hard outer shell with the soft gooey center. Because we only know it takes three, three licks to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll Pop. And we don't want that to happen. Oh, that's, I, I think that's all, uh, those are great analogies. Victor, I want to turn to you, kind of the same question. Uh, you guys just went through the most recent sensors, which, I mean, if you think about data and the collection of data and you had uh, a ton of people in the field that are accessing systems, um, how has that as well as, you know, just generally, you know, other operators working remotely, how has that impacted your cyber hygiene? Well, for, for the 2020 census, um, we actually stood up an entire um, almost separate network, you know, a whole SOC operation that was over it, <clears throat> had very good understanding of where the data resided, where what they needed to protect, kind of what Gerald said, the crown jewels, the same thing in insider threat. What you can't protect everything. What are you focusing on? Um, a lot of uh, protections enabled on the mobile devices they were using so they could remote wipe them very easily. The way they were connecting in the systems were very, they could only you know put data in they didn't necessarily always able to remove data out we did you know while we were building and deploying those systems we were doing penetration testing to verify that those systems would function the way we wanted you know we worked with a lot of other organizations to help make sure that the decennial census was secure uh and and safe um so there was a lot of there was a lot of work done uh, and the, the, the teams did a really good job of pr protecting that data and understanding where it was and how to monitor it um, across, you know, a lot of different environments. They were in the cloud, they were on prem uh, and it was putting all that together in a consolidated location using automation, using, you know, sims and other tools to help protect it. Um, as far as now with the remote workforce, I mean, we were lucky that we already had a, a fairly remote workforce, but going to 100% remote for the time period we had was an upscale. So it was kind of learning how to adapt to the environment, understanding, you know, the threat actors are constantly changing. You know, we've got some really good threat actors out there who know what they're doing. They're constantly changing to adjust to the environment. So you have to have your, your setup so that you can adjust as well, so that you're able to 
do everything you need to do from a, from a, a monitoring standpoint and a security standpoint from remote. So you still have all the data you need so you can identify those adversaries when they're doing their actions and, and they're they're trying to get into your networks. Um, I think, um, yeah, I guess that's kind of the, the main items. I don't want to go too far down in the weeds. So I, can, I just wanted to say so, one thing. So yeah, we, we always we always talk about, you know, the bad guy, the malicious actor and stuff. But we, we also see that, you know, it's been my experience. We also see we put security in place, which is great, you know, from the security aspect. And, you know, I, I'm, I come from the operations side of things. You're right. So I, I had that balance. Right. I had the balance of security and the users. So we know the users, if you put too much security in front of them, what are they going to do? They're going to find ways to circumvent because they're not being trying to be malicious. They're just trying to get a mission done. So we do got to keep that balance and understanding what their requirements and their needs are so they can, can complete their mission. If we make it too hard for them, <laughs> not trying to be intentionally malicious, but they're going to find different ways to get their job done, whether it be, you know, emailing their work thing, their work document to their personal so they can actually work on it and then sending it back kind of thing. You know, so we have to keep, when we do the security, we have to keep in mind, we have a user base that we have to be attentive to. And, you know, if we degrade performance or make it too hard, they're gonna try to find ways uh, to get their job done. Uh, rightfully so, not to blame them, but they're not necessarily malicious people. Um, so it's not always a malicious actor that we're trying to prevent. We're just trying to prevent that, the, the, the mistake people and the, and the people that are just trying to get their stuff done and trying to find ways to do it to get around the security. So I just wanted to add that. Yeah, and, and I'd like to pile on here, James, if it's okay on, on some of this, because I agree 100% with, with Gerald there, right? So I, we cannot ever forget, you know, what it is that we're doing and who it is that we're doing it for. And at the end of the day, we've got to get a mission done. And I, you know, and, you know, haven't been a CIO myself, right, of the largest multimodal a transportation company in the world, the U.S. Transportation Command, even I, right, Ed, would sa sacrifice security at times in order to get the mission done, and then security will catch up. No different than the work from home, right? So a lot of organizations had to take risk um, when we started doing the work from home due to COVID, but we've got to quickly come back uh, to this, and I think we're going to talk about culture later. But then what I wanted to follow up on, on uh, Gerald's comment here about zero trust. And yes, it's the latest buzzword in security, um, but it's really kind of important, really an imperative to understand what zero trust is and what it isn't. And for me, zero trust is really a strategic initiative that uh, helps us prevent successful data breaches by eliminating the concept of trust from an organization's network architecture. And that is really rooted in the never trust, always verify. Kind of easy to talk about from you know, government employees, right? Hey, uh, but zero trust is really designed to pro protect modern digital environments by leveraging network segmentation, preventing lateral movement, providing layer seven threat prevention, and really simplifying the granular you know, user access control. Nothing is different than the three of us that we've grown up in this business to be able to go do for normal IT systems. But what we're seeing now due to the magnitude of the breaches is we've got to take a step back and we've really got to figure out how is it that we're gonna assess, right? So it's a model, uh, it embeds comprehensive security monitoring and validation, which we've talked about, and it's data-centric security, which you know is the most important thing. But we have to start putting together more restrictions as someone gets farther and farther away from the core when they're trying to access uh, an organization's or com company data. And so at the end of the day, we're gonna go back to 101. What do organizations need to do? Re-examine all their default access controls, a lot of heavy lifting, leverage a variety of preventative techniques, you know, uh, RBAC, ABAC from, you know, identity standpoint. You know, enabling real-time monitoring, right? Again, we talk about it through automation and really start taking a look at what are all those interfaces on the data plane in which applications and data talk to themselves. And so just my final vignette on that, when we were doing the early DevOps out at US Transportation Command, you know, in the 2009-10 timeframe, what we found was we didn't know where the authoritative source was of our data 
that all the apps were trying to interface with. And so that takes a lot of nug work. And again, so kind of supporting Victor and, and uh, Gerald's you know, comments is you really got to understand the data, the sensitivity of the data and where's it coming from and where's it going to. So using that as an example, how do agencies manage the complexity of the IT environment? Meaning, you know, a lot of agencies, Gerald and Victor, and I'll go to both of you first, um, is, you know, there's a lot of tools that are being thrown at the problem, right? And zero trust, I think one of those in that like, point, it's a journey uh, that is, ongoing, just like IT modernization, it's, it's technology is advancing at rapid speeds and our adversaries are using those same, you know, technological advancements to try and, you know, penetrate our environments. But how do you manage all of the different security tools? Like, how do you know what to, to achieve a lot of what Earl was, was talking about? How do you manage like identifying what the right tools to focus on if ultimately, if the data is the you know crown jewel, like you can protect it a lot of different ways. How do you manage that? Just the complexity of of that, and ensuring that you're not just adding tools for the sake of adding tools. That you're, to your point earlier, Gerald, being effective in your cybersecurity uh, measures and environment. So, so you have to excuse me. I'm wiping a little tears from my eyes because what Earl said was just beautiful. The way he described zero trust, and I so much agree with it. So, Can you tell I'm my so, boss that. So happy. I'm so happy. My heart skipped a beat. Uh, you made my day. Um, yeah. So I did. I did go into you know explaining what what I meant by zero trust, but Earl put it together beautifully. Um, so I, I appreciate that. And so what I think, and, and Earl said it said it is. It's an architecture. We're no longer doing these stovepipes. It's not the network people looking at their tools. It's not the security people just looking at their tools. It's not the identity people just looking at their tools. The Active Directory people looking at their tools. The SCCM people checking to see if patches are done. Um, it, it's, it's, it's an architecture. It's bringing all of this information together um, and making sense of it. And, and then it's like, like Earl said, the technology, it, it, these concepts technically that we're talking about are no different than we've been doing for years talking about, but we've been doing them in literally in stovepipes, I'll say, but what we're doing with zero trust is we're bringing it all together and then we're making it and taking the data from that and making sense of it and making risk-based decisions off it in, in a dynamic fashion. Um, so it's very important to bring that telemetry in. Yeah, it's gonna be a lot of storage <laughs> and a lot of unstructured data, but AI ML will help us make sense of it and take immediate actions. But a lot of it's not, the hard part is not gonna be the technical part, I think. I think it's gonna be the people, process and policies that need to change. Yep. What is your risk tolerance? Do you understand what your risk tolerance is? Do you know your data is categorized, right? Do you know where it resides? You know, are, do you have the right people having that playbook? Do you have the right people on the field? Do you have the right coaching staff? Do you have the right support people? And do you have the right executives in the front in the front office suite um, to, to support you and make sure that you're successful in this? It's not going to be a one tool thing. Throw it in, flip the switch. We're done. We have zero trust. It's going to be bringing all the tools. And a lot of us already have COTS tools that we can leverage and, and bring that data together. Um, for example, um, if you're familiar with DHS, a CDM program, um, I had the implementation of something that was called IPOST when I was at the Department of State. That was pretty much the grandfather to what became the CDM program. That was bringing a lot of COTS tools in, like Active Directory, um, some of the tools uh, that did configuration checking, um, SCCM to do um, checking of patching, um, software versions. Uh, Active Directory for stale account. And we put scores, we put a methodology and a score around that. And because our our IT was decentralized um, at, at different places and we put a score on them to tell them, this is what you got to pay attention to. This is what you got to address. So a lot of these COTS tools, you, we can leverage and bring in that data that we have today, but it's putting that methodology and understanding what that risk tolerance is and around it so that you can take the appropriate actions based off what you believe is your your tolerance for that for the risk that maybe like it's going to be different a cleared government person versus a contractor without an nda coming you know a cleared government worker coming from a known network which i can monitor and manage 
um, on a desktop with all the greatest security agents is going to be a lower risk than uh, a contractor without an without an NDA coming from the Starbucks network or the, the coffee shop network on a personal device using a username and password. Uh, there's a different risk there. Um, so am I going to let them access the same data? Probably not. I'm probably not going to let them download the, the higher risk, download or print maybe, you know, but it depends on all of us agencies have a different tolerance for things. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah, no. And I do want to, we're going to talk about culture next because I want to understand from each of you how difficult, like even that just, just thinking about the complexity of all of the IT tools that are available and bringing in everybody from the network to the other areas, areas of a secure, everybody has their favorite tools, right? So how do you, how do you work through that? And you mentioned data, how do you define that data, prioritize them? You talked a little bit about it. Um, Victor, I want to ask you just in kind of staying on the, the IT environment um, and you working for census and uh, Gerald, I'm also curious, like OIG under HHS, but Victor, how do you, how do you work with the commerce as a whole, uh, to ensure that, you know, the security measures at the, you know, headquarters level is supporting you? Where's, where's that continuity? So we, um, so the Department of Commerce, as you know, is over us. They're in charge of a, a whole group of different agencies. So we work regularly with them and we have to follow their requirements and their uh, their policies on how we protect our data. And so we have regular interactions with them. We speak with the different team members on a regular basis. Um, we're in working groups with them to try to improve the security across the different environments. Um, so we work in conjunction with them. I don't know. Um, I think how else to, to to answer that question. It's it's a. Uh, Are there compliance requirements that commerce has that you guys adhere to, and you have your own compliance auditing requirements as well? So we build our compliance requirements from there. So they'll have a policy for compliance. Their ITS um, PB, I believe it's called. And then we'll have um, our compliance, our overall compliance document built off that. And so we have to meet their requirements for reporting, their requirements for you know assessment of, of uh, uh, systems and all the different uh, applications we have and the different systems we have. So they have the higher level compliance um, policies, and then we follow. Fall our policies have to fit within that framework. Now we can go to a greater, we can go deeper and a little tighter on those policies because they're building policies for across the entire Department of Commerce, which has a lot of different agencies with various roles or bureaus with various roles. Um, and so we have to adjust ours underneath their policy to fit within that. Oh. Earl, go ahead. You wanted to add something there? Yeah, so I, 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 there's something that was just said here is their favorite tools, right? And this is really where I think the automation piece is gonna help us. Because if one were to just go out, take their risk framework, say here are all the controls I need to meet, and just go to either Forrester or Gartner and buy every single product up in the magic quadrants, right? What they're gonna find is, it's way too expensive to own all those products. Um, that they're gonna have a lot of overlapping capabilities in those products. And you're gonna just spend you know, a ton of time trying to figure out how this stuff goes. So imagine that- I, I would just add Earl, yep. how are you gonna sustain it? Correct. It's gonna be too very complex as well. It, it, it absolutely is, which is the enemy, right? Complexity and just think about the secondary, you know, all the training requirements, how do you keep up on that for our people, you know, all those kind of things. And really, because what we're talking about is a system of systems, right? And you've got to have a handoff from your firewall to your proxy, to your IDS, down to your you know, antivirus and the other things that can be in, in the middle. But think about if we could, bring automation and machine learning into this. And you go, hey, I want to replace my endpoint. But instead of taking the vendor's 
hey, I'm gonna, here's my test, go test for this stuff, here's how I go test for it. Bring those products into your architecture because Gerald's architecture is different than Victor's and Vic has different appliance, current security appliances than Gerald does. So what he, what they want to be able to do is going, hey, yeah, this is a great product and talk to each other as peers, but really which is the best one for each of them individually? And being able for you to be able to test for that within your environment based on the threats to your agencies, because they're gonna be different, you can might find that you can take a, an, something that's not in that upper quadrant, something that's lower, far less expensive, and put that into your architecture versus going to get that one and then having all this overlapping capabilities. Because what we can show is that any one product is probably only using about 35% of it. So if you have a $100,000 firewall and you're only using 35% of it, you're losing a lot of value return on investment every day. But more importantly, we're doing it as a data-driven organization versus, no, I'm a Palo guy. I want Palos all the time. Or I'm a FireEye guy. Or I'm a Checkpoint guy. Let's base it on data using threat intelligence based on my architecture and risk framework. That's what I would say. And we're there. I think we can, we, we, we can do it today. Uh, you're on mute, my friend. I know, I know. I got the, that pesky uh, mute button. Um, no, I think that was, uh, I appreciate that, Earl, because that's kind of what one of the things I was trying to get to, because I think that's where a lot of uh, agencies and you know, private sector organizations uh, struggle with where they're not getting 100% of the investment or capability of the tools that they have uh, already. So, you know, making that uh, data-driven cost analysis decision, I think, is, is critical, um, especially as the environments get, um, you know, more complex. But so I want to kind of, we're, we're wrapping up on time. So I want to talk about culture and as cybersecurity leaders, I'd love to just hear how you champion security across the agency. So, Jail, we'll, we'll start with uh, you and then Victor and then Earl. I'd like to end on you, given you've worked, you know, across both public and private sector and um, get, get your um, input just doing both really. So Gerald, how do you, I mean, you, you've talked a lot about uh, how you're a champion for zero trust. Um, both, you know, inside of uh, HHS, but e even in the broader community, you know, how do you go about uh, champion for that? And then I, a secondary is what are the skill sets that federal employees really need to build cyber hygiene? Is there a skill set that, you know, all employees need to kind of have um, or, you know, what, what do you need to be training on to ensure better cyber hygiene? It's kind of a two, two, three part question, but I, I'll wrap it up with, with that from uh, each of you, because I think that's important. Yeah. So as far as it's definitely a culture change that I'm trying to do. So the more education I find uh, is needed um, because I think we said it, zero trust is getting battered around and redefined. Uh, especially no offense to our, our vendor that's here, but you know, they all define it differently um, based on what their solution is. And it's hard to navigate through that. So what I've done is I've established my architecture, my framework and my concepts so that if the vendor wants to talk to me about zero trust, hey, look at this first, do your homework and tell me where you fit because you're not gonna accomplish all of it, but I wanna know where you fit and where you integrate. Uh, so I do a lot of education. Um, I give, I have a presentation that I've given, I think a hundred times, uh, probably a hundred, uh, 101 today. Cause I gave it to somebody today, as a matter of fact, but I use that same presentation. And I give it to the vendors. So I'm controlling the narrative because I know what my needs are. I know what my risk tolerances are. So I want to be able to control the narrative, not them just come in and say, yeah, we do zero trust. And now I'm just doing this little portion of it. Um, like Earl said, I could buy all the, the Gartner magic quadrant things for each little functional area, but I'm not going to be able to manage or sustain that or afford it. Um, so I, I kind of, one of the thing is, is having that playbook. I think each agency needs their own playbook. Who's the people on the field? Who's the coaches? All that, like, like, like I said before, and then do an inventory. What projects do you have that contribute themselves to zero trust? Inventory those, prioritize those. What investments did I, do I already have that can contribute to that? Uh, what gaps do they fill? 
uh, can I projectize the, to use that for my zero trust and, and have that playbook and, that, and get that strategy put together. Um, and it's, it's a journey. It's, it's, not a, it's not an overnight thing. It's, I'm not going to get it done this fiscal year. I'm not probably not going to get it done next fiscal year. It's going to be ever, ever changing. Um, I do know that uh, maturity models for where you are within your zero trust architecture are, are working, being worked on. So those may help agencies, um, definitely. So that might be coming to help agencies understand where their maturity is in certain areas of zero trust. But it's a, it's a program. It's not a project. It's, you know, um, you know, there's the network portion, there's the identity portion, there's, you know, the, the data analytics portion. It, those, those aren't the same people. You got to bring all these people together, develop this architecture, and you're really prioritizing and projectizing within that. So I think you need like a, a program management officer uh, to make sure that everybody's playing and this is the architecture and everybody's going to fit. So that when we're building the bridge from both sides of the river, it is going to meet in the middle at the end of the day um, and eliminate those stovepipes. When it comes to skills, the skills are starting to blur where the 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 operators and, and engineers are blending a little bit with the um, security because um, you want to bake security in. So I think you got to be, you know, have that that good balance. You know, unlike a Victor shop where it's strictly a sock and, you know, they're doing straight cyber um, but when it comes to the engineering and the implementation of these things, it is an integration effort. So I think you need a good balance of engineering imp implement implementers as well as understanding the cybersecurity aspects. And like I said before, I'm focusing on effectiveness. I want to be effective. I'll let compliance fall in place where it may. Um, but I'm, I'm trying to bake things in. Anything modernization, I'm taking advantage of. Let's apply zero trust to it. Um, so. That's the way I'm approaching it. I, I the the skill set is, is a tough one because you know is it the monitoring people are we talking about? Is it the the threat analysis people? I'm I'm focusing on the implementation and actually implementing it. So I think I need that balance of good engineers that truly understand zero trust and cybersecurity in their specific areas that we may be doing the the multiple projects. So. No, that's great. Uh, I appreciate that, Gerald. And, th and thank you for your service and participating today. Victor, how are you championing uh, cybersecurity within census and broader commerce? So uh, as an example, uh, earlier today, we had our quarterly uh, information security meeting where we bring in all different uh, personnel from all across the organization into a meeting and we brief them on a lot of the different um, items that we're working on. So one item, we have a regular cyber threat brief, so they know the threats that are currently out there, whether it's from a generic perspective that all users are going to see even in their normal life, or from a deeper perspective, what we see targeting the census. We, we like this, today's one, we went over our pen testing program and how it can be used and implemented to support the program areas. Um, and then on top of that, our teams do monthly phishing exercises to help train the users to quickly identify those. And those are built off cyber threat models where what are we seeing actively coming in? So we can actually use real life models to show them what's happening. And then our teams do tabletop exercises with the program areas. It's not just the SOC and our threat hunters doing it. It's including their ISSOs, it's including the system administrators, it's including the government leads over those areas. So they're involved in a whole tabletop simulating an exercise so they see what's going on. Um, beyond that, we do regular cyber threat briefs to different areas. We'll, we'll tailor it specifically to the program area. So we have an economics division that covers the economic census and other things like that. So we'll provide them a brief specifically for their areas and threats we feel are gonna be more tailored to there. So we give them a lot of information so they can see what the threats are. Um, when it comes to personnel, I mean, it, it, it's kind of a couple of things. I, I agree with Gerald that in the, you know, my side doesn't do as much of the security engineering. We have an entire group within OIS that does that. And it is, it's got to be built in from the get-go. You need people who have operational experience as well as the security experience, because it's easy to make a secure box that no one can use. I can lock it in a room, unplug it, it's secure, but it's not going to be functional. I can make you have to type in a 77 character password every single time and no one's going to use it. They're going to figure out ways around it. So you've got to have those people who have the knowledge who can work in there. And there are a lot of complexities when you have an environment that is in the cloud on-prem 
different connections on how they're going through, they have to have that understanding, the technical knowledge. And currently we have a serious cybersecurity personnel deficit. Um, I forget the numbers of, of how few people there are out there that are currently doing cybersecurity. And then you also have to look at it from the perspective of the new users who are coming into your environment. You want to train them. You want to make sure they understand the threats and who's trying to get, get to them and how they'll do it, um, where they're going to learn and they're going to be, even if they fall for it and people will do it, you don't have enough coffee in the morning, you make an error, you know, um, but they'll report it and they won't be embarrassed about it. Let us know, the sooner we know we can react, we can do something about it. So it's given them that whole ballpark. And when we were on-prem, we'd have you know, different events. We'd have a security day, we'd have an innovation day, and we would do briefings and presentations during that to explain to users how to protect themselves. Whether not only at the Census Bureau, but at home, especially these days you use in virtual desktop environment. So you're logging in from your home computer to it. Other organizations are doing bring your own you know, device uh, which is a whole nother level of security. So it's, it's really educating those users so they know how to do it. Because as Gerald said, you know, the user can be a threat just because they're trying to get their job done. They're going to upload the document to, you know, Gmail. You save it as a draft. It doesn't have a limitation on size. You know, you have to mail it to yourself and then you download it. Do you have the tools to see that? So you can educate them on why not to do that and why not to use. There's cloud services out there that they can sign up for for free and put information and do you want your data to go there yeah no i think those are all all incredibly uh helpful uh tips and uh victor again thank you for participating today and in, in your service earl you mind wrapping us up and you know what are you seeing in terms of just evangelizing cyber hygiene and, and what you and, and mandian are doing to to support the customers yeah and uh th thank you james and uh before we get there, though, I do have one, one thing to say on culture, which is, for me, it's always about accountability. It has the accountability has to start at the agency head, and then each business or mission owner has to have accountability for the systems that are required for them to do their job or their mission. And I think in far too much, the risk has been delegated to the security people, right, or the CIO, and it's not their job to take that risk or determine the risk. Our jobs as professionals is to explain the risk back and does leadership want to take the risk, yes or no? And if they say yes, and there is a breach, it's not the security or the CIO's problem, it's the agency head who agreed to take that risk. And I think that's how you fundamentally change the culture. And then the second part of the culture, what I would say from the operational level in security, is that we should start being held accountable for producing the data that shows us what is the effectiveness of our controls. Are we getting better or worse over time? How much money are we spending? And are we getting the return on investment out of the tools that we have? Can you show me the data, right? And I think far too long, and there's a whole list of other questions from an accountability standpoint, but we should be able to start producing metrics like HR and finance and get away from this, oh, no, we, it's the black box, don't worry, we got it, it's hard, it's complicated, you know, kind of thing. I think we just, we, we need to be held accountable as operators to be able to show, show that spend. So from a FireEye Mandiant standpoint, what I would say is that I am so proud to be led by Kevin Mandia in a company in which we were victims of a cyber attack. And I think we showed everybody what it means to quickly assess what happened and then quickly be able to bring that out into the open, whether we were required to or not. And we were not required to do that. And it's only through that way, through this type of information sharing and to get the resources of everybody in the nation on the same page that we can actually address these threats that are to our nation. And I firmly believe we are at a tipping point to be able to, be able to against the threat. And since about 2004, I've been saying in 2025 is not very far away, that unless we start bringing automation to this game, we're gonna have the first bot versus bot, offense and defense. This is well beyond a DDoS type of track attack. If we don't bring, bring that level of automation soonest and get it in place, we are gonna be in trouble. And what automation allows us to do is to slow down time so we can think about what actions do we want to do next. 
and a whole nother presentation I can talk to you about the OODA loop and cybersecurity from, from my view. But thank you very much. Appreciate being here. And Vic and Gerald just did a tremendous job, I think, on explaining a lot of these key concepts. No, 100%. I really, I mean, certainly uh, I'm like an inch deep and a mile wide. And I think you guys have been able to really help me better understand uh, what is required for a good cyber hygiene, the difference between, you know, compliance and effectiveness. And, and I think we're, you know, based on the work that you guys are doing and your service, we're definitely getting there. So again, I just want to thank everybody for tuning in to cyber hygiene, reducing the risk of uh, cyber attacks with data and automation, and, and thank each of you for participating. Of course, thanks to our sponsor, FireEye Mandiant. This would not event wouldn't be possible without your uh, support. And uh, we have recorded today's session, so keep an eye out for an email. We want you to share this with your colleagues um, and for government executive. I'm James Hansen. Enjoy the uh, rest of your day.